Hello, everyone, and welcome to another book club edition of The Secret Origins of Mint Condition. I am your host, James, and joining me for this book club is Joe. Hey, folks. How you doing? And Chris. Hey, y'all. And also joining us is Mint Condition MVP and returning guest, Richie Garofalo. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> And uh, yes, we're very happy. I'm mean, Richie. I waited to do this book uh, with when you were available because uh, you had to be part of this conversation. And uh, audience, if you don't know already, hopefully you do because I would have put it in the Facebook group that you should have read this ahead of time. But I don't know if anyone has to read it ahead of time because I'm going to say I think up there with Watchmen and Crisis and The Dark Knight Returns, this is probably one of the most influential books in the DC universe, both when it came out and to current. I think it's one of the books that has influenced writing and writers and they keep going back to the well. And it's, I think one of the definitive versions of a lot of the characters that we hold and love dearly. So our book today is kingdom come by Mark Wade and Alex Ross. And um, I was thinking about the, when I was getting ready to do the intro for this, this show, cause I always like to give a, you know, a little backstory about it. Um, aside from this book, just being so influential in comics in general, especially the, you know, the DC universe, this, this book I feel like is very mint centric, like of the people who hung out, especially during Richie's time, everybody read this book like mm -hmm. this, this and Richie and Chris, you can, you can speak to this. And even Joe, like we had a few trade paperbacks we kept in the store all the time. Like the Trinity was like Watchmen, Dark Knight and Kingdom Come. And I feel like everybody who was in our circle that we connected with read kingdom come I, my, even, I mean even the name of the mint movie was named after this yeah. right yeah well, so that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah so uh <laughs> so this book i think is highly influential for for a lot of reasons and uh, and richie i'm gonna give you credit i don't know if you remember i think you introduced me not only to this book but at the same time having doing so you introduced me to alex ross who is one of my uh favorite artists of all time so i thank you for that as well my pleasure well that's the reason why i picked up the book to begin with um I'm, I'm going to start off here with saying that, um, you know, I think the first time I, I, I shouldn't say read the book, but looked through the book, I, I don't know how much I really read. I, I read it two weeks ago and I read every word this time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't swear that I read every word in the past. So, uh, it, yeah, um, Alex Ross's um, artwork is amazing. And Mark Wade isn't a bad writer. <laughs> no, it's very uh, true. I mean, our, seeing Alex Ross was like really um, inspiring because uh, you know I was going to art school at the time and I was an artist, and uh, it's it was like you know fine artists like painters and stuff kind of always looked down. I feel on graphic artists, and it wasn't as like well accepted to be a graphic artist or an illustrator as it was to be like a fine artist. And uh, here you had Alex Ross who was doing Norman Rockwell. Uh, style paintings in your in the DC characters, so it was like really like amazing. You know, just to, I just want to take a moment to thank Alex Ross. It's like really like I I was like I'm so impressed and amazed by his work that uh you know he quickly became one of my favorites and showed that you could do anything with the medium if you mm -hmm. wanted to. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so it, just fantastic work. I mean, you know, again, I don't know how many I probably flipped through it more to look at it in the first two Richie when I first saw it because mm -hmm. uh it's just amazing to look at and he's doing so much in every panel that I can't the assignment alone in my mind as an artist, and I don't know how you feel about Richie is like, I'm going to, we're going to do this story, which is complex, but I also am going to do it um, on a canvas and paint it and do everything that he's, he's doing in these, in these uh, panels is, is fantastic. It is. It's incredible. Um, you know, when I was looking through it, you see all these little details and all these other little extras, you know, that, um, that grab you and pull you in and, and make it more, even more realistic, uh, I guess, you know, because there's other nuances that are in the background. And I know when I'm, when I'm doing my caricatures, when I'm working on the Studio Days comic strip, there's yes. a plug. Yes, please plug, <laughs> plug away. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I throw a lot, I try to throw some things into, um, you know, there's, there's little things that you do that, try to accentuate what you, the story you're trying to tell and uh, make it believable or realistic or if not that you know you go oh look look at that you know um there's there's a rat in a sewer you know um running under this woman's legs in the street you know it's just the little things it, that um just give the viewer something else to um 
to be attracted. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot. Of, yeah. Oh, sorry, Joe. Go ahead. No, I was going to say the uh, the last chapter, the one year later, when they all meet the three, the three oh, they meet at the bar at the uh, restaurant. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so much in the background. There's George Reeves's costume hanging on the wall. There's a model of the flying bat cave from the the early Silver Age. There's even a, a looks like a chessboard up on the wall, which and has the, um, the Justice League members drawn at the bottom of the chessboard, which is a throwback or a callback to Justice League of America Volume Issue One, 1960, when they're being moved around as chess pieces on the board by the villain. So there's so many little touches and tiny things. Bullet Man and Bullet Girl, Salt and Pepper Shakers. Yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's great. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, yeah. It's I was just gonna say like you know aside from um, drawing the main the forefront characters like having to be like doing a panel and then be like a set designer basically in every panel is like it's and again the level at which he's doing in this book is is phenomenal. So um, I'm sure we'll be talking about his art more, but uh, I want to hold on. I'm really quickly too. The thing that I that sort of always amazes me both in terms of like how present, however present Kingdom Come was not just in my mind but also in my condition. But the amount of work that, you know, as y'all are describing, the amount of work that Alex Ross put into all of this, and you can't help but, like, notice that, like, in the upper right-hand corner, this is an Elseworlds. Mm -hmm. So much effort to put into a story that, like, isn't part of continuity. Right? Ah, that's a good yeah. point. Like, yeah. there's an element of this that, like, they could have, you know, it's a it's a good story and it's and it's something that people would enjoy. But, like, when you look at a lot of other Elseworlds type stuff or, like, what if, it's not that the artwork isn't good. It's that, you know, it's kind of amazing that they would put this much effort into a story that doesn't technically happen in the DC continuity. I, no, that's I, a great point, right, Chris. I agree. Well, I think, I think it, okay, geez. no, I was just going to, I think it, because of like, you know, to your point, Chris, like it was an Elseworlds that they put so much love in it to a mm. lot of people. This is the future like that they want to yeah. have for these characters. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to remember that that's not the future, that that's not the, that that's not the continuity, that that's not actually part of like DC lore. It's an illustrative love letter is what it is. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Well, Chris, I kind of wanted to, as we start our dive deeper into our discussion, as we did with like our first book club with Joe and Born Again, this was your number one favorite book. If audience, you go back to episode three or four of the podcast way back mm. in the early days. And so um, what you, if you could just like recap some of your thoughts, Chris, you know, you've done it then and you've done it a couple other times. But why is Kingdom Come your favorite book of all sure. time? Um, I think it just it all makes sense to me. Like, I know there are a lot of times, uh, you know, when we're looking at at heroes or characters in the future um there's often a lot of disagreement about where they end up like we've talked about the last jedi and some of us think that what happens with luke and last jedi makes sense and some of us don't um we think about that in in other stories too i mean especially joe you know we've talked about superman and the direction he goes in in the future in a lot of other stories and like how that doesn't feel like superman um we've said the same thing about batman i mean really these 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 big larger than life characters they were like, this character would never do this. Or this character would never go into that. But I, all of this makes makes perfect sense to me. And everybody is addressed in their in their own way. You know, it was so funny that like off the air we were like, wait a minute, we don't actually know which we don't know which Green Lantern or which Flash this is. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, I mean, that's clearly Jay Garrick. He's wearing the helmet. And then we're like, we're looking in the back of the um, the collected edition. It's like, oh. It's actually a manifestation of the speed force that's thought to contain like the essence of all the speedsters. So it's not just Jay. And then we're pretty sure the Green Lantern is Hal, but it's not really outlined specifically. So like the amount of thought that went into these characters and how we can project into them, to me, I never thought about which Green Lantern is it until one of you, James or Joe, I can't remember who asked, wait, which Green Lantern is this? And I'm like, I never thought about it. It was always Hal and Jay. Um, despite the fact that like timeline wise, those don't, those don't match up, right? It should be Jay and Alan, or it should be Hal and Barry. Mm -hmm. So where Superman ends up, his his decision to hang up the cape, which to me actually makes a lot of sense in that context where he thinks that he's serving a greater purpose by, you know what, if my help is not wanted, then then I shouldn't offer my help. Um, and I don't, I don't see it as petulant. I see it as him trying to do what he thinks people... The, the people want 
And so he just thinks of this as a way to serve is that he, his service is no longer wanted and he doesn't want to be where he's not wanted. So I, I didn't think of it as petulant. I thought of, there was definitely fear there. There was definitely shame there, but, um, and there was hurt. There's pain, right? There's pain that Superman hides. We forget that like the best part of him, the part that people most, we don't realize, but we most admire is the human part of him, right? When the, when the man is more important than the super as Norman McKay puts it at the end, which by the way, I mean, it should be clear, but spoilers, um, <laughs> You know, I think I think that's really impressive. I think the fact that they really call out that Diana walks this this fine line piece through force. Mm. I love I, I don't I don't love it for him. I understand I think this is like you know, sometimes when we, we see a character taken out of a story because it's like, ah, they'd be too powerful. We saw this in, in Endgame, right? Where Captain Marvel doesn't show up till the end, because of course she doesn't, because She's too powerful, right? She can't she can't be there from the start. Otherwise, she renders everybody else redundant, right? Um, the fact that they remove Jean Jones from the equation in such a big way, but in a way that really resonates with the character of like in a moment of desperation, he opens his mind to the to humanity and he's shattered by it is like so heartbreaking, but so real. So I think for me, one of the biggest elements of this story that really attracts me to it is the fact that, like, I can see everybody behaving in this way. Um, and 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 so, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing for me is, like, I can absolutely understand how the, the various characters get here. Um, and I love the the surprises along the way, you know, especially the one at the end where, where finally Diana manages to surprise Bruce. Um and I like the other little moments, like when Superman leaves the cave and Bruce goes, huh, that's what that feels like. <laughs> you know, and then Captain Marvel in, in such a big way. So this was, I know he had done this in a, in another story. And since Kingdom Come, he's done it in a lot of stories. Um, but the way he keeps hitting Superman with magic lightning, um, I had never seen that before. And I thought like that's such, I had only ever thought of the, the, the lightning bolt as a way to transform. I had never thought about it being used as a, basically what? being weaponized. Yeah, weaponized, exactly. Um, so yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I also think that like on a large, on a larger scale, I think the book does have a lot to say about um, some of the, like the cyclical nature of history, you know, where at the very end, it's like how many people survived just enough to leave us with the same problem we had before, um, mm. you know, generational, generational trauma, generational conflict. Um, I like that we see that like, you know, while while Bruce and Clark are are were best friends, they they do still they still you know butt heads over uh, and and over time that becomes sort of unsustainable. Um, I like that like Bruce says, "You left, I stayed." You know, they trust me; they won't trust you. And Superman's like, "They don't trust you; they fear you." Like Bruce is still missing some of those elements, right? I also really love that at the very end, Bruce's presence is not enough to save the day. That it that it really is like he's there to help and and he but but it's it's just not enough and it does come down to it comes down to the humanity in the heroes and that's what makes the story work right is that Superman has the humanity to to realize his mistake and give the choice to Billy and it's the humanity in Billy it's not the wisdom of Solomon it's that Billy chooses life he doesn't pick a side he chooses life over death. Um, and that that's what break that humanity is what breaks him free of, of um, being enthralled to Luthor. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a lot. And that's honestly not even like a comprehensive, um, but I, I just, this, this story just hits for me. It just hits on every single level. Yeah, it's no, very I, comprehensive and very good. Yes, yeah, that was very good, Chris. It was very, <laughs> very good. I can follow along and agree with everything that you. Yeah, I can't yeah. add much, but yeah. Well, for for you know, for Joe and and Richie, uh, Richie, let me go to you first, and then I'll go to Joe. Um, given the two of you obviously lived with these characters for so long before this book came out, like Richie, what was your uh, first impression of reading like this story? Where you did you like like Chris said, like where everyone went with the what the ideas yeah. for the characters were. What are your thoughts? No, absolutely. I agree with everything that Chris was saying. I mean, it was believable. It was, it, you could see that it could make sense what happened to Superman and, um, and then coming back and I mean, ultimately being, you know, the guy that he, he was the human, the, you know, um, yeah, he was getting away from being uh human and was being super instead. And, 
um, it just it just all flows with the the character that I felt I grew up with. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just really, really quickly, Richie. Yeah, yeah. I see. Like that's one of the other things. Like the de- we talk about the details in the in the art, but it's also the details in the writing of how you know Bruce continually. And I think some of this is to annoy him, but some of this is to remind him of his humanity that he continues to call Superman Clark throughout yep. the book, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have Diana, who does start by calling him Clark, and then he stops her, and then she does. She starts calling him Cal, and then she keeps calling him Cal because she what she wants from him is for him to be to make the super more important than the man. We want she wants you know she wants him to be the man of steel in that moment. The steel is more important than the man. So like so yeah, what you what what you're saying, Rich, makes makes sense to me that humanity being reflected at sort of like every level of the storytelling. Yeah, the, I mean, you bring up Wonder Woman, and Wonder Woman, um, you know, she was being more the warrior, and I mean, there was a point where you know she makes the decision to um, to fight, and Superman's like, you know, what, where, where do you get off deciding to do this? And yeah, well, you're being a wimp right now. Somebody's got to lead, and you know, she gets her armor on and she goes into battle. To put down the rebellion at the and, end, uh, and the, uh, jail. great, great moment where she gives him a kiss, and the way it's described is, um, I think it's lips of lips of marble scraping against the steel, yeah. Like that. yeah. Um, but it's a kiss devoid of passion, and I just I love the way that it's illustrated, but also the way that it's described as a reminder of like what they're both made out of. Um, yeah, that that's that's a good moment, Rich, when she. When she walks away after she breaks the table after Captain Captain M has been murdered. Yeah, Joe, what were your first impressions like when you encountered this book when it first came out? Um, I honestly don't remember, but reading it for the most for the third or fourth time now recently, um, you know, I agree with Chris that Superman did not self exile himself out of malice or anything like that, more out of disillusionment. But that you know comes with unintended consequences when Earth's greatest protector, for whatever reason, turns his back on, 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 on the thing he, he loves the most, humanity. And uh, we see what happens when the, you know, uh, when the younger heroes run amok and, uh, you know, and you know, uh, become judge, jury, and, ex- and executioner. And he has to come back into this world to, to set things right. He has to reestablish his, his, um, his connections with his, his, his uh, allies and past friends but, you know, as Chris said it, about Billy, it, Billy makes the choice to be, you know, uh, his humanity makes the choice. He chooses, you know, humanity over everything else. And that's what Superman has to do. He comes back. Yes, he comes back as Superman, but it's really the man. It's Clark that is, is the savior. I see as the savior here in, in, this, in, this, in this particular story. And it just reaffirms, you know, how he's, he is Earth's greatest protector. Not because he can, you know, move continents and, you know, fly multiple speeds of sound and, and shoot laser beams out of his eyes, but because he can inspire. And, but this Superman, even though he's inspiring, he's troubled. He's troubled before he leaves the farm. He's troubled after he leaves the farm. And he does need his allies. And, he, and at times throughout this, uh, this book, he's at, he's at odds with his allies, especially Diana. Uh, so it just makes it this great, you know, operatic, uh, you know, uh, uh, epic. And uh, these these iconic characters are, are uh, you know, just elevated uh, uh, by uh, Wade and Ross. And it's, um, I guess it's what drew me, drew me in then, but it certainly drew me in this, uh, reading it the last couple of days. So, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, people talk about Watchmen and they talk about... Uh, 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 Dark Knight Returns, but uh, you know this is if this isn't as good as those. It's right up there with them. Yeah, I, I like I said, I agree. I mean, as we were just saying, like it's it's a book that's been so impressive that it's it's almost willed itself into canon without mm-hmm. being canonized. I mean, uh, not to not to give anything. Away, well, I mean, this is this is coming up in the world's finest book, right, Joe? Like, it's, it's gonna oh be, yeah, this is going to be a storyline that Mark Wade's going to touch back upon in the upcoming current run of World's Finest. Already touched. He's laid the groundwork previously in the story before this one that's going on right now, and he's going to be coming back to it, yes. So Kingdom Come still exists in modern time as the, the mm-hmm. story. And I think also at San Diego Comic-Con, they announced they're doing an animated movie of it, right? 
I think that was uh, one of the announcements. I think so. I'm not sure. I didn't, I didn't keep up with yep. Comic-Con this year. I don't so. know. We'll see, I suppose. I'm we'll not, see. I'm yeah, not I mean, on that, but we'll see. Yeah, I think, uh, well, we've touched on the trinity of uh, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, but uh, our entry point to this book is is Norman McKay, a, uh, a, a, a pastor of his parish, and mm-hmm. he is the guide for the right hand of vengeance, the Spectre, mm-hmm. which... I think this is a, a great version of the Spectre. It was a very, you know, like having read Swamp Thing, I think Alex Ross was pulling on that version of the Spectre from the Alan Moore run where he's, um, you know, Joe, I mean, I think you kindly lent me the early um, Spectre books, which were which were great. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> some were gruesome sometimes too with what uh, what they allowed Jim Corrigan to do. But, oh, um, the Fleischer run in Adventure yeah. Comics back in the 70s, yes. They yes, were very yeah. gruesome. <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, this is a specter who's uh, who's really fulfilling that more s- spiritual, godly role that uh, that Alan Moore placed him in during the Swamp Thing run. Yes, and uh, and I and he's also battling like another layer of a person. He's lost his humanity. He has mm-hmm. no. He doesn't have his compass anymore, and so he needs a human to guide him mm-hmm. as to what where where vengeance should be um, should be put. I kind of like that though. That's another thing that I really really like. I like that even though Superman does rediscover his humanity, he still needs a human to put it in perspective. Mm-hmm. It also mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense, right? Because like his parents and Lois are all dead at this point. Yes. So like there's there's that element and also I mean even though it's not really mentioned, um we also know that well we can presume that that Jimmy Olsen and Perry White are, also died in Joker's attack on on um the Daily Planet. Mm-hmm. Because it was all men and one woman, that was Lois. Um, but that he needs that tether, and I like I like that idea because I, you know, I think it's that ultimate power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and we see that with even though the Spectre was once Jim Cork and he was a human, um, he has power now. So it doesn't. It, it, I don't want to say it doesn't matter that he was human, um, but things change. You know, things mm-hmm. absolutely change. I think we see it uh, in, a, in a different way. We see it as we get older as adults that we we forget how kids think, right? We were kids, but it sometimes it doesn't matter that we were kids. It's easy to lose sight of this is how kids think. And it sometimes is very grounding for us to listen to people who are younger than us to like offer that perspective again and remind us. And we see that Superman needs that too because Norman shows up and says, you know, at the very end as he's bringing down the ceiling of the UN, um, Norman says, don't, they're, they're never going to forgive you for this. So forgive yourself. And he's the one who tells the specter, like it, specter doesn't know. He doesn't understand. Um, he's a little too out of touch with, with his humanity. Um, but Norman says he's angry at himself. He's not angry at them. He's angry at himself. And if you can't, if you don't let me get there and reach behind his anger, like this is going to be disastrous, right? This is going to be tragic. Um, so I, I kind of like this idea because also that's, that's what Superman acknowledges at the end is that we ruled from above instead of working alongside you. And it doesn't matter how much humanity Superman has. It doesn't, even if he puts the man in front of the super, the super still exists. And so by definition, I think this is, you know, how do you serve? You serve alongside people. You don't serve above them. And so that's something that I really, really, uh, really dig. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like, it's, yeah, I like how there's parallel themes with everyone's different storyline about this. I think the, I mean, the groundwork for the, the story seems the humanity. Like, oh, yeah. Without a doubt, yes. You know, being in touch with the human level problem, or being in touch with your human level um, base instinct seems to be the basis of the story. And that, well, and that makes a lot of sense, right? Because you look at, um, you look at the fact that, you know, Alex Ross had been working on the Marvels, right? Um, and that's, that's what the Marvels is. The Marvels is all about humanity right it's it's all about in this in this story um it's it's an examination of these different superheroes that we all know human torch spider-man luke cage the fantastic four the coming of galactus um the death of gwen stacy all of that is covered in the marvels but it's all um it's all perceived by you know um um phil sheldon um you know the guy the the reporter the guy who works for the newspaper right and so like that what does it look like? And I love that angle because so frequently, um, you know, we, we look at these superheroes, we look at them in awe and, and it says it in kingdom come, you know, we thought of you as gods. Um, and it's so easy to look at it from that perspective, but then we see movies that, you know, that periodically we do mention like, wow, a lot of people died when Superman and Zod went crashing through that 
entire city block or yeah, like through the town metropolis yes. right like and we see the avengers they save some people but like let's be honest when some of those buildings come down lots of people die and like i know that's not necessarily part of what we want to consider because this is escapism and i get all that um but i like that from this angle it's like you know it goes back to oh gosh i want to say i want to say this is from superman for all seasons um in which somebody says i think it's lex says there's nothing there's nothing more terrifying than a miracle i think that's where it's from but now i can't now i'm questioning myself it might it might actually be from avengers age of ultron anyway there is nothing more terrifying than a miracle so it's really i like that from from in kingdom come we get to see some of from the from the standpoint of of humans like yeah this is especially in the beginning of the book when you're seeing the descendants of all these superheroes and supervillains just throwing throwing hands in the streets um that it's it's actually horrifying right this there's a lot happening here that that isn't inspiring at all it's terrifying the um uh the uh, mckay pastor uh he was actually uh, the model for, for 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 him was um uh ross's father actual father uh and he used him because you know we know that ross used models for many of his characters in the, in the, in the books he uh he painted he illustrated um and, and yeah, he's the point of view character. He's the everyman character. He's the guy that he's, we are, we are, we are, uh, we are him. We're, we're going on this journey with him through this troubled uh, future universe. And uh, we can, we can, um, you know, commiserate because we're human and we've had loss like all these characters have had, especially Diana and Bruce and Clark. And um, do we let the loss, you know, overwhelm us? Or do we get back in the game? And um, ultimately, they have to get back in the game because that's what they do. That's what humans do. You pick yourself up and, and you dust yourself off and you get back. I can't help the sports metaphors. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, that's the way I see life. Um, but yes, you get back in the game. So this is what I, this... I, I think that makes sense. I mean, that's after all, that's what um, that's what a number of them, a, sort of a number of characters sort of a cost superman about right yeah mm -hmm. he hadn't, that he hadn't gotten back up that he hadn't bounced back the way he was quote unquote supposed to yeah very much so um that that scene on the farm that when we first see him when he's putting the tractor away it's um kind of like um uh you know a parallel scene to action comics number one <laughs> he's yeah. smashing the car into the uh into the cliff but this time it's he's just well day's work is done i'm putting the, <laughs> i gotta put my tools away <laughs> That's a great, great, great visual. It really is so evocative of, of what 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 Clark lost and what's to come. Actually, so sure, and it's and it's what they've all lost, right? Diana's lost her tiara. She's no longer princess of the Amazon. She's been stripped of her royal title, so she's lost something as well. Right, um, you're right. I mean, Joe, you're absolutely right. Like, there's of course, if I, I may, that you pointed out Diana losing, being stripped of her title and her home. Again, because I, I, I live in this pop culture world, I make these uh, connections. Diana is very much a wolf like character, Mr. Wolf like character, because he was he had to go through this commendation, the Klingon Empire, and he lost everything, right? His oh, name, sure. his family, his title. So she, she you know, I, I was, I was, when I was reading this, I was thinking, oh my God, this is, Diana's a Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but not really, but there's, there's parallels to that. So, yes. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, I like too that, I mean, everybody, everybody who's grieving strikes out, right? Which is what humans tend to do. Mm -hmm. Everybody who's grieving tends to strike out at other people. Yeah. Out of curiosity for, and this is for, for all three of you. And if this is getting ahead of things, James, go ahead and feel free to rein me in. But, um, did it, did out of the three of you, you know, what are your, what are your favorite moments in the book? Like it could be just a panel or a, a phrase or a page or whatever. Wow. That's, wow. um, yeah, well, well it doesn't it doesn't need to be your like absolute favorite but like okay let me phrase it this way when you when somebody says kingdom come what's the moment that jumps into your head okay the, the last page of of uh the uh issue issue one where he's coming down with the uh alighting to, towards earth superman with the, the with the heroes in tow he has one in each hand right we've seen that image uh, a lot and the image i just alluded to before i'm looking for it right now um on the form, yeah. Yeah, with the uh, track. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's even I'm looking at page uh, 31, and we can't. You know, I guess we 
you know, we don't want to skirt this issue, but there's obviously there's a lot of religious in, imagery in this in this book. And there's a scene where he's on top of the roof on the barn and he's holding a uh, a crossbeam across his shoulders, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it's the uh, it's a very you know it's it's, it's a very uh, crucifixion type panel that uh, scene. You mean actually, even if you and that yes, yes, but also it's interesting. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and. Um, there are also, if you look in his back pocket, it is Ooh. in that panel, but in the next panel to his right, you can see the nails, the carpenter's nails. Oh, you're right, Chris. They're yes. back, they're, the stakes are in his back pocket. Right. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. All right. So those are things that jump out. And the, and the final chapter, one year later, when they're, when they're having lunch, the three of them in the, in the, in the restaurant. I just think that's a, it's, a, it's a, an incredible uh, sequence for what's happening there when you know, we find out that... Um, Superman and the clock of Diana are going to have a baby, but I just love all the stuff that's going on in the background. <laughs> so those are the things I think about when I think of Kingdom Come. Richie, I'm curious yeah. as, as an artist, what strikes you as your favorite like moments or pages? Well, the, I, I, mine goes to the end one year later. I, I, I guess because of the happy ending or whatever you want to, however you want to put it, that's where my head usually goes. Um, I just found, I think I found the page you guys were talking about with, um, I'm going to go Clark with the beam um, over his head yeah, uh, on, on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. Well, that also reminds me of um, Superman number one, that pose. Oh, the, the, oh you're right. Uh, Superman number one from 1939, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, when he's up, on the, uh, up, uh, in, up above Metropolis. I think I think that's exactly right, Ray. I think you nailed that one. Yeah, pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yes, it's, it's all those kind of little things that that really get me. Uh, and you know, the holding the tractor over his head like he did yeah. in the number one. I mean, these are all the little things that um, you know go through my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, it's just Superman in general. When I see him, I just that character and that artwork around that character, I really like. That's like the first thing. And then Wonder Woman and then everything else. Um, I mean, Batman is, I don't know, lack of a better word, he is Bruce Wayne. You see him with a collar yep. around his neck and he's, mm-hmm. there's nothing, um, I don't want to say special about him, but, um, you know, the other, the other characters, they're still young and young enough and whatnot. And um, I don't know, I just, uh, Superman is always my hero and my, uh, that's where I see the power. Um, I'm, I, I go into a different tangent uh, and I'm trying to avoid political, but I mean, the stories behind here and, the, you know, Superman laying back and, you know, letting the kids do their thing and it becomes a more violent thing. And I just feel like we're kind of going through that right now. And I don't mm-hmm. know if it's going to come forward and and help us get out of this. Um, never. No, I, I, I mean, um, every every generation has, has the, um, not the right, the responsibility to pay forward what they've learned and the mistakes they've made and hopefully they've corrected to pass that along, or at least admit the mistakes they've made, and pass that along to the next generation. And when you, when, you know, you see when these characters, you know, just turn, turn their back, this is what happens. So, yeah, it's, uh, and then as, as Chris pointed out at the end, you know, uh, they're going to serve not as gods, they're going to serve alongside humanity and try to put a better foot forward. And it's all connected. You can't, you can't just say, okay, that's it, we're done. You go. It's yours now. You take. No, you 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 have to you have to prepare the next generation to be the leaders of tomorrow. But you 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 can't completely divorce yourself from from the world because everybody is, has a worth and everybody has something to share. And in this case, these are superhuman people that 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 uh, that uh, turned their back. And as I said at the beginning, there were unintended consequences that happened because they weren't there to um, to enlighten to uh to uh share their victories and their mistakes with the next generation right yeah and i i don't know that younger generations now are more violent than we were when we were younger i think i think it's 
it's easier to record and show the violence. I think it's easier to see the violence these days. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily an increase in violence. Also, how do, how we, how, not just how we observe violence, but also how we define violence. Um, I think that, you know, versus, versus years past when maybe some was written off as not that bad or, or not necessarily worthy of mention. So I think there are some of those elements at play, but I also think that, you know, I think that the problem, one of the problems is it's very easy to point fingers and again, intergenerational issues, um, as opposed to finding ways that the generations can work together. I, I read this book recently and I'm going to have difficulty reminding myself of the name, but, um, but the, the guy who wrote the book, he writes about how, you know, so frequently as we age, we try and work harder to stay on top of our game in certain fields, especially fields based in innovation and, you know, the grind. And it's like, and we, and we continue to fade anyway, and it's not our fault. It's because as we age, you know, there are certain things, there are certain skills we used to have that we can't access anymore. You know, it's like an aging athlete at some point, you know, at some point you age out of a sport, but you also have a lot to offer younger athletes. I think as we, get older, we have a lot to offer younger generations and it's tough. I think it can often feel like a one-sided a one-sided exchange, right? Young people can often feel as though um, they're being told what to do and they're, they're not, you know, their, their own experiences are not being considered. And I think for, you know, for us, as we get older, it's easy for us to dismiss young, younger people by being like, well, you don't, you don't have any experience. I have the experience just, you know, for just for a minute, listen to me. And it leads to this dismissal of the virtues of being older and the virtues of being younger, mm. what we can accomplish if we work together. Cause you know, as we get older, that's, you know, this is why I can't come up with the name and I, I try not to beat myself up over it anymore. But as the guy who wrote the book explains, he's like, you know, when we enter that, that back nine of our lives, mm. um, it's harder to come up with the names of things that we could have said, you know, we could have pulled from our memory, actors, books, movies, whatever, um, we could have pulled that from our memory like that when we were younger, but now it takes longer. And part of that is just the library in our, of our mind is so much bigger, but also the librarian is moving more slowly. Right. So yeah. like, you know, there are advantages to having young and old, older folks work together. And so like, you, you know, you mentioned Joe passing on that knowledge, but also needing younger folks to be willing to look at that knowledge and be like, ah, maybe I can try something new with what you're showing me. Exactly. Maybe and older people, you know, us, I, I, you know, I start, I'm, I'm middle-aged now. So I have to start thinking about this too, of like, you know, I share the information, what they do with it. Um, just because it's not how I always did. It doesn't mean that it doesn't invalidate what they bring to the table. And I think that's part of why I like at the end of kingdom come, you know, you see some of the old and some of the new heroes, right? We see that some of those people who survive in that little, that little green bubble, um, that, that Green Lantern creates to like protect um, to protect everybody. We see some some old heroes. We see some new ones, and we see it later on too. When like for example, um, Diana's uh, Diana's um, title is is um, restored to her, right? And we like for example, one of the survivors, and I love this. One of the survivors is Magog. Yeah. You know, on page one ninety nine, Magog is one of the survivors, and so is this the person with like the green reddish hair that looks like maybe they're you know, some sort of offspring of Joker maybe. And like, um, it's just, it's really interesting to see Magog who like now is one of the older heroes, but like in the beginning of the book is like the new generation of heroes. Um, he's got his hands on the wheelchair, like Hippolyta's wheelchair. So like, it's the younger taking care of the, the older. And I, I like, I like that element. Yes. Uh, I was going to say, Chris, I, I love your uh, librarian analogy and, you know, um, you just said you're through middle age. Well, I'm the other, I'm further along, and um, uh, I see the librarian as being, you know, way down the stacks. And it just takes him or her a little bit longer to get upstairs back to the uh, desk with the book. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, this the, the book is, um, I ended up having to look it up, but it's called From Strength to Strength Finding Success, Happiness, and Deep Purpose in the Second Half of Life. It's written by Arthur C. Brooks. So are you having trouble getting upstairs, Chris? <laughs> oh, I, I do constantly. I actually still make the effort sometimes. Periodically, I will try and fight it. And I will tell myself I'm not going to I'm not going to groan when I stand up or sit down anymore. I'm not going to do that. It's obnoxious. And then I stop fighting it. And I'm like, this is just the sound I make when I sit or stand now. Yeah. So. 
<laughs> no, that's a great analogy, Chris. I love it. Uh, yeah. It's, what, it's, what about you, James? What, you have a, things that stick out to stick out to you. Do, is there any overlap with Joe and Richie? Yeah, there's overlap. I mean, I, I like, oh, you know, I will just say I'm always a sucker for a splash page, you know, uh, so and, and poster art. So I like, you know, just for my own personal taste, I like the first appearance of the specter when he's coming through the stained glass. Um, sure. Because I like really, like, I think it uh, somewhat embodies some of the like the messages in the book. It's also, you know, a great. I I feel like a callback, like I said, to the Swamp Thing interpretation. That um, is a Steve Busiek, Joe, or Richie, who wrote, who did the Alan Moore artwork. Um, what, what book are we talking about? If for the Alan Moore run of Swamp Thing, is that Steve Busiek who's doing the artwork, or who's who's the artwork back there? Um, no, the Alan Moore run of Swamp Thing was uh, oh lord. Beset, yeah. wasn't it Beset? Beset, Steve Beset. Beset, yes. Steve and then Beset, later so. on, um, um, I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, but Beset was the first line, yes. Yeah, so Beset. Beset, it reminds me of some Beset work. Um, I, I like when Superman appears with all the heroes for the first time. I mean, I also love the one that Joe and Richie mentioned where he shows up at the end of, you know, the first issue, um, you know, for that, that heroic moment. And, mm-hmm. and I'll always call back to, you know, the when Batman arrives at the end. You know, oh, yeah. you know, with all of his team. Um, and I'll say, you know what, uh, this is, t- Richie, you were kind of alluding to this. Um, yeah, Batman, I mean, not Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman and the rest of the heroes kind of stand up. The Bat- Batman is more Bruce Wayne in this book. I mean, he's actually hmm. more Batman since Batman is, Bruce Wayne is Batman at this point. He doesn't or... bother with the Bruce Wayne mask. He's Batman, but unmasked. Yeah, and uh, and the costume that Ross did, well, it's 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 not that, it's, I don't know, it does, it, the design never like really um the design of the armored suit didn't ever do anything for me <laughs> like i love this book but i'm just saying the batman suit was never like as impressive as some of the other designs that he's done for the other characters that's just me personally sure. no i i can appreciate that when i think visually of of batman because there are three moments in this book that really um that really stand out to me that i love two of them have batman in them but the batman moment that uh, that that jumps into my brain is when he clocks billy batson Mm. I love that moment, yes. especially because Oliver Queen goes, are you kidding me? We've been living <laughs> in mortal fear of Billy Batson, but the way he just clocks up that, that, that little panel, I love that panel. That's one of my like three, three moments I think of when I think of this book. Yeah. yeah that's I can, a fantastic I scene. Completely forgot how Bruce plays Lex Luthor in this book. I just love that too. That was great. You know, the heel turn there, the, uh, yeah. The, yeah, he knows. You know, it's it. It's one of my favorite moments in Justice League Unlimited is when he gets captured by the, you know, the society. Oh my god! Like, yes, stuff at any time, but he's stuck around to keep an eye on Joker. It's the same thing with Lex, where he's like, <laughs> yeah. "Oh yeah, no, I knew this the entire time. I was literally <laughs> just here to keep an eye on Captain Marvel." <laughs> That's great, That's, and it's and it's almost more insulting, right? Because he wasn't there to keep an eye on Lex. That's not why he was there. He had Lex handled. This was literally all about Billy, and that's it. Oh, he can multitask. He's the, he's the Batman. I know, I know, he can. <laughs> he didn't need to. That's why. You're right. You're right. No, you're right. <laughs> and he throws that little uh, remark at the end in the hospital with Luther. He's like Shazam. Shazam. Uh, yeah, Shazam. yeah. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's a uh, yeah. I, I that, that was like you know. So Richie, I'm on, I'm on with you. Like uh, I I like all the Batman moments, but he's not in costume for these moments anymore, and he doesn't have to be. Like of the things that the heroes lost, Bruce. Maybe Batman lost the lease because he only lost the identity that he didn't care about anyway. I mean, he didn't care about the mansion. They don't, they don't get into it, but I do think that I think he's lost Dick, right? Dick, Dick, um, sort of signs on with Superman. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. but they don't. You're right. They don't really address it. I, I think you're right. I think he's probably out of everybody, and it's probably why he's able to sort of keep going in the way that he had been going in the past. Is because the only thing he's really lost, he's lost some of his like his physical ability, right? He basically like lives in that metal frame now. Um, but, uh, but like he hasn't really, if anything, he's sort of gained in that he, uh, he doesn't need to, although this, it, this does mark him losing his humanity as well. He doesn't have to pretend to be Bruce Wayne anymore. Yeah. 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 I, I, I also think it's interesting. I don't know if you guys saw it this way, like Superman, like starts off being you know when he returns is like this great moment but as he's like working and building and like him and batman switch for a moment where you know superman always i always think is the person of like personal freedom and bruce is like you know peace through fear whereas mm-hmm. and then the line i guess is crossed when he when superman does the uh gulag 
And that's when Bruce is like, hey, this is, I, you know, I'm, I'm for police state, but this is a little too much here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. where's, where's, where's due process? Yeah. Like, and the gulag you know, looks like the, uh, the Legion of Doom uh, hideout, right? From oh, yeah, I think, very yeah. Intentional. I think that's yeah. very intentional. Yes, yeah. Um, I, th- I don't know that there's any other way to write Superman. It's sort of like how we talked about what does it take for Superman to, like, quote, go bad. Um, he doesn't quite go, like, bad in this book, but in, in every instance where he, like, his compass, his his compass is always his rock is always lowest. Mm. That's always the bedrock, the foundation of 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 Clark. And so, um, yeah, to me, it, it makes sense that the sort of the only way to get to Superman being on the wrong side of history is when he is when he decides that um, that people need to do what he says, right? Because that's 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 the only way to. Um, it's always a question of like in these stories. It's always a question of how he gets there, right? Because author, author, author ah, authoritarian Superman. Um, you know, it's it's easy. It's such an easy route to take because he has all the powers, right? So, like, the only real question is how does he get to that point? Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know what's interesting? There have been other stories in the past, uh, back with before there were elsewhere stories, there were imaginary stories, where Superman has gone bad and he's He's left Earth and he's exiled himself. If not, not that he's gone bad, but maybe his powers are out of whack, and he's exiled himself on the moon or someplace on the other side of the galaxy. But this Superman, he goes back home. He goes back to the farm, and I think that informs very much why he's able to to come out and skirt the issues you just you just talked about, Chris. But never fully go over to quote unquote. Sure. We go again the dark side, mixing that genres again, but. Um, because he, he goes back to to the nurturing ground of the farm, to what, you know, Jonathan and Martha gave him. And I think that's that's part of him. Yes, Lois is his, is his, is his compass, but his foundation is, is Jonathan and Martha Kent. And I right. think that's why he's able to do what he does. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's I think a great also, book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think also in this book, though, like you were just talking about how he gets there, it's... Um, for the most part, in the beginning, everybody wants him to lead. Like mm. it's mm. not like it's not like he's um, he's a little. I think I wouldn't. I don't know if he's reluctant. I, I got the impression like he wasn't looking to take all this on, but he yes. did because he showed back up, and because he did, everybody, all the heroes who are returning, and all the humans who see him want him to take the lead. So yeah. it's sort of like he needs. I guess he needs that shakeup that uh, you know, Rich. I think you pointed out as one of your scenes, like when she's uh, when Diane's suiting up for armor to fight the Gulag is when he's like starting to realize, wait mm-hmm. a wait a minute, this yeah. might not be a good idea. Yeah, exactly. I, I have a question for the two artists on our panel. Uh, now, uh, this was this entire book he he painted, correct? Yeah. Okay. So, um, Rich could and James, could you speak to the? Um, the craft that went into this and how, how, um, how, how he might've done it or what it took to do, to do what he did. You know, and could you do it? <laughs> Hell no, I, no, this is something that, um, I was looking forward to tr- attempting to do in my retirement time. Uh, I'm, I'm a pencil and ink man. Um, I'm not a painter. Um, I attempted a couple, a few times. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's, it's, it, I, it requires a certain amount of, a lot more talent and a lot of, um, you know, teaching. I, I think I, I've got a lot to learn, but I can't even imagine how long this had taken. You know, what do you think? What what medium do you think he's using here? Um, acrylics, um, watercolor, combination. I'm asking, artists, I'm asking you guys. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it looks, it could be acrylics. It could even be oil, I guess. But uh, probably not oil, probably acrylics, because it would take a long time to dry if it was right. like a... Yeah, that's my thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't actually think, I mean, I, I can't speak for him because I didn't, uh, I didn't, I wanted to read all the supplemental material in the back of my trade. I just didn't have time because there's so much supplemental material. But um, but I don't know of how long the turnaround time was this because they do they do have a thing in the back of my thing uh, book here where they came when he, let me see if I can pull it up, but um, cause Alex, Mark Wade, there's a recount of Mark Wade getting a call from, I forget who was the, um, the editor at DC comics at the time saying Alex Ross, who just did Marvels wants to do this thing for the DC, DC universe in the same way. And I think it was only like two or three years before this thing was published. Yeah. So 
it was it was not a long time. It's not like I mean for me to do I, if I could even do it, I would spend years doing this. Not not a couple of years. My entire life would be trying to do this book, um, and not even at this level that he's doing it. So yeah, I think um, I think it's acrylics, and I think I, I don't know what the term. Oh, he. Um, let's see. This conversation came on April eighth, nineteen ninety four. And I think this came out in what ninety six, ninety yes. seven. Yeah. Wow! So he did all this work in that amount of time. It's bonkers. Incredible. Um, Puts Frank Miller to shame. <laughs> All Star Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh yeah, well that that book is like well that yeah. book is beautifully drawn. It's just it's, it's, it's Jim Lee is is giving that is some of the best Jim Lee artwork on the. Right. And I'm going to say it on one of the most terrible stories. But yes. Yes. Wait to, Jim, wait to Jim Lee on that. Book. Um, do you know that uh, um, Mark Way was not the first choice to pen uh, to pen Boss's Epic? It was gonna, supposed to be James Robinson. Uh, that's who Alex Ross wanted, but um, uh, DC said, "No, we're going to pay you up with Mark Wade." And Wade was very, very uh, trepidatious about doing this until he found until he found the hook. And uh, I guess that's what every writer needs to find, right? How am I going to, you know, where's my entry point into this story? And uh, so it's interesting. Where we, you know, we, he wasn't the first. Wade wasn't the first choice. Yeah, that is interesting. You know, I the, the 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 like I said, the thing I was referring to in my trade paperback of Kingdom Come says that uh, I guess when they couldn't get Jerry Robinson, the the editor went to Mark Wade because he's like Mark, like Alex needs somebody who has a good understanding of the history of the DC exactly. universe, yeah. as is what his the criteria was for getting paired up. And I guess Ross had an outline, so I guess Ross gets like a writing credit on this too. I mean, yeah, he would get you know um, he would get co creator right exactly yeah. Um, kind of like, kind of like Kirby, uh, Kirby and Lee, and uh, with Fantastic Four back yeah. in the day, after, after the first year or two, when Kirby, Kirby was just basically, you know, Stan had a two-page uh, uh, plot and he gave it to Kirby. Kirby came back with twenty pages, and Stan just dialogued it. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, I'm sure Ross had all these designs in his head and and everything when when he came to it, but yeah, I. I, I have I have no like is this is just a, such an impressive artist and the fact that like th- like this is the level like he uh, Ross always does like the fact yeah. that, I mean because it wasn't it wasn't that long Richie I don't know if you remember Joe or maybe Chris like uh, it wasn't too long after this when he released his like uh, what are the, was that prestige format books the remember he did the one on, with Batman and Superman and Wonder Shazam Woman? Yeah. Batman Superman Wonder Woman um, he did a Justice League one yeah also I call them Treasury size remember those Treasury books Chris, yes. uh, Rich yeah yeah. 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 It's like original comic book. How they... Oversized, yeah. yeah. I have I have all those. Yeah, they're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous books. Yeah, and they didn't they they didn't come out that too long after this, or maybe right. my memory is wrong, but it wasn't that long. It wasn't that long after this. I mean, in in the relationship of the type of artwork that it was, it's definitely not that long. So in '96, um, I took over Mint, and this was out, and and the, those other books had to be with within two or three years of that. Rich, do you remember how, how well this sold? Uh, this is a four issue series, correct? Uh, the original series, four issues? Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, I, I don't I don't okay. remember. I think this was the overlap with- um, John and Joan? John and Joan, yeah. Okay, so I mean, you know, we'll do some research, find out how, how, how well these books sold. A lot of times we, we look at these great classic works uh, in, in, in different uh, mediums of pop culture. And we find out that, oh my God, they didn't do too well at first, like The Wizard of Oz <laughs> right. and, things. And, and The Godfather got off to a rocky start at the box office. But then we, you know, years, decades later, we look back and we, see, we know that these are, these are true works of art. In, I mean, uh, yeah. I don't have the research, and, but I'm gonna say, I think, I think this was an instant classic given how the, it seems the community as a whole, I, I've never heard a bad thing about Kingdom Come. I mean, no. I don't. I could be wrong, but you know, the three of you maybe. But I've never heard, no. read, heard, or listened to a podcast or something about comics where anyone's had anything negative to say about Kingdom Come. Well, I think no. at this point too, you know, he had already, he had already, Alex Ross had already done the Marvels. Like Marvels mm-hmm. had already been done a number of years before, um, what, three three years before that. So, like, I think there was probably some buzz around anybody who either enjoyed the Marvels and, or wanted to see that kind of treatment for DC characters. So I think I think Marvel's probably helped pave the way for this to become a bit of an instant classic. Hmm. Um, but I mean, you know, also, I, I, story story aside, because I, I, I don't think it's... I think 
comic books have it right. You know, artwork is what's going to attract people. Um, and I think that when you look at the the kind of work that Alex Ross does, um, it makes sense to me that it was like an instant draw for folks. And then it's like, oh, it turns out the story's good too. <laughs> yeah. You know, which like, great. I mean, that's what you want to see. But um, but it doesn't really surprise me that like it 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 became popular as quickly as it did i think the i think the um the atmosphere was right for it i mean it's in sales i mean richie you can i think we sold a lot of we sold a lot of trades just going back to what I said oh, yeah. the podcast oh yeah <laughs> well, but when you look at that cover like i mean come on like that's and also uh, do you do you remember richie where we kept it i think we kept it in in multiple locations to be honest with you i think it was in the in the rack with the new comics at times. I think we kept mm-hmm. like, you know, as soon as it was sold, got another one to take his place. As soon as it was sold, we got another one to take his place. Yeah. Um, it was just, that was a constant. Um, yeah. I, I used to keep it on the spinner rack that we had near the front of the store. Yeah. And, so, I mean, you know, it also has to do with where, where you all were placing it. I mean, the cover of the, the trade paperback is, is very eye catching, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a it's an interesting perspective because it's lower than all the heroes, right? It's it's from below, it's from ground level. You're looking up at su- you're, and you're looking at heroes fighting, which like we know for a really long time, heroes fighting each other has always been a big draw, which is why there were like so many issues of comics where heroes have a misunderstanding and they fight for a little bit, right? Because it's, it's always like, well, which the heroes don't fight each other, so who would win in a fight between Superman and Captain Marvel? Well, we'll show you. you buy our book. Um, well, actually, Chris, you're you're diving into a good point. I actually have a different edition now. Which which which? How did everyone read this book? Was it I have my hard, my hardcover issue in front of me, which is signed by Alex Ross. Rich, there's a story behind that, right? Yeah, you were there, but uh, my mine has Superman in in, uh, in a box on, on the cover, and he's, yeah, he's in, mostly in shade, looking very forlorn and very pensive, and um, there's light and shadow, obviously, playing across his his torso. So that's the that's the co- cover I have. Me too. All right. I've got my copy from, I've got the copy I bought at Mint Condition. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. I got mine from Mint Condition too. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is when I first got it. It's, it's uh, Superman and uh, Captain Marvel fighting on the cover. Batman and Wonder Woman are fighting above them, but it's, it's, it's all that um, Oliver Queen's in there. Um, but it's all that, um, that, that last doomsday battle. That's the cover that I've got. <laughs> Well, the uh, the I well, I let this I let my copies go a while ago. I did have a hard cover that was signed at one point, and I did have your edition, Chris. But recently, uh, my uh, Karen got me a new the newest copy, and the newest copy it might be an original cover, but it's it's when the heroes are flying are all floating in. I, I don't know if it's mm-hmm. like a in the Superman's in the center and all of his yeah. team is floating in. So it's that's when the, it's when the Justice League is constituted and they show up for the first time mm-hmm. yeah so that's uh, that's the cover yes, that, I'm looking that my, at it right now yes yeah that's the current edition that i have so it's uh, a great, yeah it's a great page which i think is another good way to sell the book i mean it's a it's still a very uh, striking cover and everything so yeah, sure. uh, um yeah but uh richie you want to i think because I, I i think i also credit you you i mean i know you and joe have a story that you're going to tell about meeting alex ross but you also took me i think to say alex ross at the warner brothers store the the long, right. long, great forgotten Warner Brothers store. How we miss it! Mm. But, uh, <laughs> oh, what a great story! That was. But, uh, but Joe or Richie, why don't you tell your Joe? You met Alex Ross too. Yes, I, I won. I re- repeatedly go to that store, and I, I put my name in, uh, in for a contest, and I get something in the mail. You invited to uh, spend an evening with Alex Ross at our store. You can bring three friends. So I immediately thought of Rich, and Rich, uh, we 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 took Steve Perel, right? And and yep. Ray was it Ray also? I'm going to say probably, I thought Dennis might have come. Oh, was it Dennis? Yeah, I tell, yeah. it was Ray or Dennis, yeah. I remember you picking me up here at the, where I live here in, um, in Madison Gar- Park Gardens, and we drove over there. And the, But there was somebody else there with him at, at, uh, at the table, at the signing table. Was the, but it wasn't Mark Wade, right? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I was so focused on, I, I didn't even remember there was somebody else there. <laughs> I do remember telling, uh, uh, after he signed my copy, uh, Alex Ross said, you know, this is this is every bit as good as Watchmen. And he said, well, I don't know about that. I said, no. <laughs> yeah, I remember him. I remember that conversation. Yeah. yeah. So. He's very humble. He was. He was, wasn't he? Yes, yeah. that's what I remember. Yes. Appreciate very, very humble. You were there and um, enjoyed his work and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, considering the kind of artwork he does, he didn't have to be humble. <laughs> no. 
uh, you know what? That says a lot about the, the man and the artist. Yeah. Yeah. When it comes through in his art. Yeah. And then Richie, I think I think we went as a uh, with maybe maybe with Steve and Dennis and Ray also because he I, I I went with you to a signing at the Warner Brothers store where he was where he came out with that piece the seven where he did the seven Justice League members with their arms folded. And uh, and we went to a signing. He just had an open signing. I, I remember I didn't even. I think I brought it maybe Kingdom Come and uh, and he he didn't charge. I, I don't I don't think we had to buy anything because I, I remember I people were buying prints of the seven, but I we couldn't afford that. No one in our group was buying it, but they were sending like little postcards, and he just signed one of those postcards for me. Like I got oh, to meet him, cool. signed the postcard. So I don't know if you remember that event, Richie. Um, vaguely. I'm sorry, vaguely remember. Um, I. Don't, but I, I if if I got a postcard, I don't know what the hell I do with it. I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> really, um, yeah. I know. I know. Um, when I went with Joe, I, I didn't bring anything with me. Steve did. Um, I'm pretty sure Dennis did as well. Um, yeah. But, um, um, I had the. I don't know if I purchased the hardcover there that night or if I had it. I brought it with me. That I don't remember. Yeah, that's true too. I think maybe if you. I, you know, it, it's, you know, recall, recalling this stuff is difficult. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, if you five years ago. bought a book, if you bought the book, he would sign it. Mm-hmm. I think that's the way it was working. So you didn't have to pay anything more. It was not like it was, um, you had to pay $50 for him to sign something like no, that. No, not, not like at a convention, Artist Alley, where they rip people off. No. Yeah. Uh, James, the image you're talking about, the original seven, right? Uh, Justice Leaguers? Yeah, I yeah. think I, I think that's the image I have on a plate. I bought a commemorative plate uh, at, at that same store, and I have it in my break front here. Um, I'll I'll, make, I'll send I'll send a photo. You can you can put it on our Instagram page. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I think it's the same it's the same image that you're talking about. It's great. I love that. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't remember when he came out. I just remember that was because I kept the post. I may still have the postcard. I don't know, but um, yeah. I remember just like I remember it being a great event because like you know, wow, me and Alex Ross and. You can, he'll just he'll just sign if you're there, okay? And we just waited online. Like I don't remember, like we spent a lot of time waiting online either. But it was, uh, you know, and he, he seemed very humble, very nice from what I mm-hmm. remember. So yeah, but and that was a great piece too. The seven, like I mean, I can't, I've never seen Alex Ross piece that I didn't like. I mean, every everything he does, <laughs> everything I can't say like oh he he phoned it in for this one. Like everything he he did or does is, is looks like amazing. So. Um, my only, I think my only regret now is going from Kingdom Come into the Alex Ross show. But um, I, my only regret is like I wish he had done the artwork inside for um, for Earth X, not just the covers oh. and the and the characters. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, hard not to make it the Alex Ross show, though. It really is because it's it's the the story that Wade writes. I think is is good, and there are a lot of cool moments, but um. But I don't know, from a story standpoint, I don't feel like there's a lot that he does that hasn't been done before. Yes, and at, at, and the art the artwork by Alex Ross just elevates the story. And and, then, and when people think of Kingdom Come, I, Chris, you're right, I think we, we think of Alex Ross first. I think it's I'm not, No shade to, to Mark Wade. Like he's doing no, some great stuff right now. Of course not. But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, like the, the twist on the twist on Martian Man. Sorry, my chair is squeaking here. Um, <laughs> the twist on Martian Manhunter is like, it's good. I like yeah. it from a narrative standpoint. But what sticks with me? It's not what he did. It's the fact that when it's the way that it's, and I don't know if this is was Alex Ross who did it or Mar- Mark Wade who thought it should be drawn this way, but the Spectre when when um, oh gosh when um um. Oh, the the pastor's name. Good lord. Okay. Norm McKay. Norman McKay, thank you. When Norman says who is he, he looks familiar, and the Spectre says he was once a Martian champion, he like lifts up John Jones to reveal the Martian manhunter underneath, like kind of cowering. Yes, I'm looking at it right now. And that reveal is like it's so powerful, right? And the way he's drawn sort of in a panic. Um so it's it's Again, the, the story really is great, but it's the art that, you know, we've talked, and we've talked about this in the past, right? That, like, if you put Alex Ross on a book like Dark Victory, it doesn't really work, I don't think. It's not that it wouldn't look gorgeous, it's that it doesn't fit the story. Meanwhile, if you put Tim Sale, um, you know, if you put Tim Sale's artwork in something like Kingdom Come, I don't think it works. Like, I don't think it works at all. Um, 
and and Tim Sale is my favorite artist, so it's not an issue of I don't like the guy or I mm-hmm. think he's limited. It's that I think you need the the art to fit the narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, uh, you're yeah, I don't want to make it the Alex Ross show and credit where credits do, but like at the end of the day, for me, I don't I don't know how much as much as I enjoy the story, and obviously that's I went on and on about it at the beginning. I'm going on and on about it here. Uh, as much good stuff as Wade puts in there, I I just don't feel like there's a ton of it that that hasn't that hasn't been done before. We've seen Diana become a little more savage. We've seen what happens when Superman becomes a little bit more fascist. We've seen how mm-hmm. Batman like is broken but keeps going anyway, right? So like we've seen almost almost all of these these things before. Um, not necessarily in this combination, but you know, um, you know, Batman, uh, Superman, Clark, and uh, and Diana getting together at the end of the story. That's been done. We've seen what happens when Lois dies. Like, so I don't know. I, I don't know that there's a ton here. And maybe this is also like with the benefit of however many years plus at this point. Oh my gosh, we're coming yes. up on we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of Kingdom Come. Uh. <laughs> like, Holy cow! And in, like, four uh. more years. Okay. So with that benefit of like 26 years that are behind us, um, I might be mixing up timelines, but I don't know. I didn't feel like Wade brought, he, he wrote a really good story, but I don't think the story is what makes Kingdom Come resonate quite so hard. I think it's the combination of story and Alex Ross's artwork. And I think yes. that Alex Ross gets the, the lion's, the lion's share of this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I like I love Wade's work. Wade has written many great stories. I mean, he wrote mm-hmm. Tower of Babel, one of my favorite stories. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, same stuff. here, same here. So, um, but Alex Ross is, I think, fair to say, doing the heavy lifting in this project, and mm-hmm. and and it was a passion project. I mean, he came to DC with this project, so like he, right. it's like this is love and time and caring about these characters that he puts on the page. Uh, you know, it's uh, that's the only way to describe it. And now the book came out, and uh, I think Mark Wade just. It seems like Mark Way just facilitated a venue for Alex Ross to, to get like some of his thoughts and ideas for these characters into the page form. Sure, sure. And and again, like, you know, all credit to him. I think, you know, this happens a lot of times when it comes to like I, I think actors and film or theater, where um this is this is something that can be sometimes for people who don't know any better, um, you know, you have you have the straight man and you've got the funny guy, right? You've got Abbott and Costello. Mm-hmm. And Abbott, like Costello is not nearly as funny without Abbott. So there, there's a fundamental, we need the, just like we need um, light for there to be shadow. You know, sometimes you need the straight man. In this case, you we needed Mark Wade to set up Alex Ross. That's mm-hmm. all. Um, and, that's, and that's okay. It's not, you know, it's not a dig on Wade. It's just, um, he had to, he had to get out of the way so that this could be all about Ross, maybe. <laughs> I agree with that. No, that's great. Yeah, you know. no um, nice. and we've all been there. We've all we've all had a situation where, like, maybe we didn't get as much credit as we deserved for a thing that we did, but but we were okay with it because we knew going into this that we were trying to set someone, we were trying to set up someone else for success, and this wasn't about us. It's to me. Here we go again. Sports metaphors. It's like hitting behind the runner, getting that guy to second base. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, uh, no. so, so there is there there is there is value and virtue in setting things up for other people, definitely, especially in, in a creative medium. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I just want to also say, like this book, like aside from you know, I kind of my started this this whole podcast talking about its influence in the comic industry and and, and our time in mint condition. It was also like the book is like penetrated, I think, mainstream because like the symbol that Superman wears with the black S is also mm-hmm. like something people recognize too who are not even like big into, uh, you know, comic books. Not that like that the culture is comic books now, but the, the black logo of Superman or that thing, that's like, you know, something that you see in like, you know, stores that sell Superman shirts now. Like it's something that's accepted as like one of Superman's designs. So I think it's just like pretty profound how this book just continues to expand. Um, Sure. After the worlds at war storyline, uh, where there were many deaths, including, um, Lois Lane's father, Sam Lane, Superman adopts that uh, that that S symbol on his chest on his costume. Yes, so even the company uh, uh, went back to it at a, at a later date. At, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, I, I was reading some of the I read some of the supplemental materials, and just to go back to the question I asked offline that you brought up earlier about Green Lantern, it is Alan Scott actually. 
He it makes, is. It is. It is. In the in the sketch in the sketchbook in the back of the trade, he when the Green Lantern page it says Alan Scott eventually forged the he absorbed the center of the lantern into his body and he forged the outside of the lantern into his armor, and uh, and Jade uh, Jade is apparently in the story briefly like yes, she's. Yes. she's and uh, she is the, uh, I, he doesn't go into great detail, but she is the picking up Hal and Kyle's legacy is what he says. Ah, okay. Interesting. Because I, I do remember seeing Jade uh, briefly. Um, but that's so interesting that it's Alan because he really doesn't, he doesn't look like Alan to me at all. He just, everything about him screams Hal. That's so funny. Yeah. And, and he does make reference, like we, you point out that the Flash is in the embodiment of the Speed Force, but he does make reference to Jay, Wally, and, and Barry in the okay. little Flash section. So okay. there's a little I, bit of Wally in there, too. <laughs> I also like, this is so many little things, I also like the, um, the look of Orion. You know, the son becomes the father. Yes. Oh, right? my God. <laughs> oh, good. I completely so forgot good. that when I read it uh, the other day. Wow. So I mean, we might have already touched upon this, but as we're like coming to an end of this, like just to like reiterate, what's everyone's favorite character design? I mean, Richie, what's your favorite character design? Or maybe what's our, what's everyone's favorite redesign of a of a classic character? What hmm. book? In the book, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, God, I'm I'm thumbing through now. I mean, I my gee, I wonder what I would say off the top of my head. Um, not that Superman's is, um, no, I mean, I think Superman's is cool. I mean, listen, if it's Superman, yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually like, I, I was reading some of his notes, some of his inspiration for it, aside from like Superman being in mourning, I guess with the black is also, he was going back to the original S that Superman had in the first, um, comic, his first iteration of his costume. Yeah. Jeez. I'm thumbing through this real quick. I don't know. I go to the back and see what these pinups are over here um it's funny i said um batman's wasn't that impressive to me or wasn't he wasn't batman much but in the in the pinup i mean in the um in the cast of characters they have in the back of the book with the numbers on it um mm -hmm. i do like the way batman looks there and specter <laughs> yeah. I, I but specter's no different than the way he was when i grew up I, I guess I like all the original, um, the the original character designs. Um, I'm looking at this, and you know, nothing against Alex Ross. Um, all the the new heroes, quote unquote, new heroes. None of them did anything special for me. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say like not. <laughs> anything we say nitpicking is because we love this book, obviously. We've been talking about it for an hour and 13 minutes, but... Uh, <laughs> right. But I'm just going to say... Like, <laughs> yeah, I would just say, like, you know, I don't... I, what, I'm what i sure Wade intentionally does. Like, you don't really get to know, aside Magog, you don't really get to connect with all those other characters. I, I would also argue, and I could be wrong, but I would argue also that Alex Ross intentionally designed characters that way, and, and by extension, Mark Wade. You know, Richie, I think you bring up a great point. You say that like you're not really inspired by any of that, uh, by any of the new characters. You're not meant to be. Exactly, right? Chris. We're not, we're not meant to be inspired by these new characters. That's it. that's one of their shortcomings, really. So I think that that actually speaks volumes about. And I, I again, I could be wrong. Maybe I'm giving too much credit. I don't think I am. I think Alex Ross intentionally designs them to maybe like look cool or you know newfangled or whatever but like he does not design them to look inspiring because mm -hmm. they're not inspiring yeah hit the nail on the head chris that's exactly right. well this is a i'm reading i find i found the page on magog's the character design and this is this is what uh mark told me originally make him look like everything we hate about modern superhero designs <laughs> there you go, there you go. That's yeah, there, there's a touch of cable in him isn't there yes because i yeah. hate the cable's design <laughs> uh, for me it's um superman obviously but i'm i i like what he did with hawkman because hawkman is more bird-like right he's just like you know yeah. uh, and uh the flash or the the, the speed force character that is, that, become, that is the Flash. He's constantly out of focus because he's constantly moving. Uh, uh, and, and the aforementioned Orion becoming his father. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm right there with you, Joe. Those are the two I would pick. If you asked me off the top of my head, I would have said Flash because I love that constant motion, the blur, the electricity running over his body, the fact that he's, he does not look human. There's a semblance in there somewhere, but he's right. 
moving so fast now that there is no slowing down for him. Um, that would have been off the top of my head. But I think more than that, uh, once you mentioned it, it was like, oh, yeah, of course, Orion, the way yeah. he stands with his arms behind his back, yeah. just <laughs> like Dark Side did. Um, the, the way he managed to, he's clearly Orion, but the way he shaped his face, I had never before been able to see family like like family resemblance between Orion and Darkseid. Exactly, Chris. Makes it happen. I don't know any other place where I've seen that family resemblance, um, and and Ross does it in a way that's like you cannot miss it. I think yeah. it's fantastic. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I personally I like as you know I like uh, I like the Green Lantern design. Yeah, I mean, I like cool. all the, the characters you guys talked about too, but I like the Green Lantern. I mean, he was originally going to be the Green Knight, but they decided to keep Green Lantern just to keep it with continuity. And I actually like the Red Robin design too. Uh, hmm. I agree. I like the Red Robin design. Yeah, it's it's very like modern or updated, but still very classical Robin. So yeah, and he's got like, if you look at the um, the sketches in the back, it's got like a little bit of that like Burton Batman design in it too. With the boots and the way they, they yeah. Alex Ross draws the cow, it's like a little eighty nine Batman design to it. It's cool. I just love Nightwing's design so much that I like. I couldn't get into it. Oh no, I agree. I mean, I'm not passing which is that. Which is absolutely not fair. Not fair at all. But <laughs> I'm not saying I prefer that design over Nightwing. I'm saying of the characters of the book. Yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I, I think the Red Robin design is cool. Um, and the fact, I mean, also the fact that he put a lot of work in design that we barely see Red Robin on the page like yeah. i think there's maybe one or two appearances of him in the battle scenes but uh like yeah just the level of like the the sketchbook stuff in the back of, of the trade like all of that stuff he sketched and designed and there may be in it for like parts of panels if if that yeah uh, um and every character like we could go through on through the supplemental material right. forever but every character has a back <laughs> every character has a backstory back there in the in the yeah. character designs i also want to bring up something i know we're reaching the end here but i do want to bring up something briefly that that i will attribute absolutely to mark wade I think the humor is spot on in this book. I don't think there's too much of it. I don't think it's campy, except for the very end. But the humor of the things that are said, like, good afternoon, citizen. How can I help you? They said that I would make a good, what do you call it, green arrow or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, I like that when the waiter says, what do you, what do you have? You know, it's uh, Diana wants water. Clark will have milk. And Bruce says, I want coffee and keep it coming. And um so a lot of it happens there, but like, you know, you mentioned Shaz him saying Shazam to Lex earlier. Um, I think there's a lot of good, like, there's good humor in the story too. And it's not like, it's not everywhere, but it helps break up some of the, some of the tension. Um, and I, I, so I think that's, I think that's well done. I, I like the humor that's, that's in this book. Some of it is like about breaking the fourth wall. Um, some of it is just like, it's, I think the, you know, here's the other thing I think that, and it's why it's so relevant to this book. I think the humor is very humanizing. Like, for example, at the very end, Jim Corrigan is upset because the Spectre platter is spinach and cottage cheese. <laughs> <laughs> upset about that. And like, he has to be like reassured by Norman, like, you know, it's flattering to be remembered at all kind of thing. Like, I don't know. There's something about that, that, that I, I, I appreciate when humor is deployed well in a story like this, in a story that's not not meant to be humorous, but it helps break up the tension. I think it's very complete storytelling. So, and and there are books where we don't get that kind of humor. As much as I enjoy, for example, as much as I enjoy um, Batman Year One, we don't really get humor in that. It, we no. get very little of it. Whereas, you know, I think in Kingdom Come, we get we get the right amount, and I think that's important. So. Can you imagine being a waiter and having having have you have to wait on a um, uh, an agent Bruce Wayne because he sends the steak back? <laughs> well, no, he, tries, but he doesn't have to. Clark heats it up for him. No, that's right. Yeah, Clark heats it up. Yeah. Right. But he's complaining about it, right? And he's just that, that little moment, like right before that, when, like they're waiting for their food, and the guy behind that, says, yeah. uh, "Excuse me, aren't you?" And Bruce just goes, "Yes," and he's like, "Are you using that ketchup?" And he's like, "Ah." Uh, <laughs> like he thinks he's been recognized as Bruce Wayne, but he hasn't. Like even those little moments, really. Yes, you're right, Chris. Yeah, they're they're, they're not over the top. Right. They're very organic to the scene that he's setting there, and uh, it, it just works perfectly. And that's oh, so, that's yeah. a very good. That's a strength of Mark Wade that he still yeah. is employing today. By the way, in his writing. 
Yeah, no, I, I believe that. I mean, I think again, always that humor. And you're, and even though I did like, I did correct you and say he doesn't actually send it back. There is that moment where the waiter is like, "Well, which steak do you want?" There's the the, be- the man of beef or the yeah, yeah. <laughs> well done, and then sends him away. Yeah. Also, I like that Starro is a casserole. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> I forgot that <laughs> Starro is a casserole. Nick. <laughs> uh, well, I think we covered everything, right? Do we have any uh, things we didn't cover as we wrap up this episode? Uh, no, I think we I think we did a, 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 an excellent uh, deep dive into this. Uh, you know, we could probably go on for another hour and a half, probably. I'm sure we oh, could. There's always stuff. I mean, you know, I'd like always... to go back to page one and start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it by panel by panel. Uh, well listening audience i hope you enjoyed this deep dive into kingdom come i I hope you've read it before you listen to this this episode because we definitely spoiled it but um and and you enjoyed it if not if you've listened through this whole thing and you haven't read it it's still good to pick it up i would read it it's beautiful to look at so 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 go get go pick up kingdom come um i could not obviously do this episode without my other co-hosts so um thank you joe for being here Oh, thank you, James. This is a this is a hoot. Thanks, Rich, for uh, gracing us with your presence. This uh-huh. and, thank you. Thank and, you for inviting me. Oh, yes, yeah. thank you, Richie, for being here. I, I really appreciate you being on this on this uh, podcast and also introducing me to this book many many years ago. So thank you. And um, and Chris, thank you, of course, for being here for being this number one book of yours and for uh, for being on this podcast. Yeah, no, I echo what Joe said. It's always my pleasure, but also it was so great to. To have Rich here, it's been a very long time since I've gotten to record with you, Rich. So this has been great. And uh, listening audience, if you have thoughts about Kingdom Come or anything we've said on this podcast, you can please put them on the Facebook group when this episode drops in the comment section. Um, You can also follow us on Instagram at Secret Origins MC. And we thank you for listening, and we will talk to you on the next episode.